What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 33 of the Half Price Concessions podcast featuring Donald Bradshaw. Before we get to Donald, I want to say a big thank you to everybody and anybody who is listening to our podcast. Whether this is your first listen or you've listened to a few episodes, we really appreciate it. If you like what you hear and you want to help us out, hit the subscribe button if you're listening to this podcast on a podcast app like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, any of those. We really appreciate it. If there's a section to leave us a rating and review, please do so. Take five seconds to do it. That would really help us out. If you're listening on our YouTube page, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. And if you want, you can leave us a comment. We read all the comments, good, bad, or indifferent. We really appreciate it. You can also listen to every episode on our website, www.anchor.fm slash HPC podcast. And as always, you can email the show at halfpriceconcessionspodcast at gmail.com. Donald Bradshaw is a pretty cool guy. I got to work for Donald for a couple of years uh, when he was uh, part of the ownership group of a dirt late model series that was running limited late models. But Donald's got a pretty good story. In the most uh, Here in the most recent history, him and his wife Gina have become car owners with their Paler Motorsports team for... Tim McCready, who drives on the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. Um, Donald and his wife Gina, through their uh, business Mega Plumbing and Mega Electrical, have sponsored Jonathan Davenport for a long time, the three-time Lucas Oil National Champion. Donald himself has been involved in racing for quite some time as well as a driver. He's driven dirt uh, super late models, crate late models, and limited late models. And he's also got some pretty cool go-kart history as well. So. During all this coronavirus stuff, we're trying to exercise some new options, and one of those is doing interviews over the telephone so we can keep our social distance and we can still talk racing. we still got a few kinks to work out, so you might hear some popping noises and some of the audio. We apologize for that. We're working on making that better. But the parts where Donald's talking, it's nice and clear, and you can start to hear the story that he tells about his involvement in racing, his love in racing, and just how life has been going for uh, the Bradshers during this time. So sit back and relax. Episode 33 of the Half Price Concessions podcast with Donald Bradshaw is coming up in just a few moments. This episode of the Half Price Concessions podcast is brought to you with support from Performance Center Racing Warehouse. In addition to being the home of the PRW chassis, Performance Center offers in-house setups and consulting plus suspension and chassis pull-down analysis, along with their fabrication shop that can reclip your race car with the fastest turnaround in the industry. Give Roger Johnson and the Performance Center team the chance to earn your racing business by calling them today at 704-838-1400 or visit them online at performancecenter.com. That's P-E-R-F-O-R-M-A-N-C-E-N-T-E-R.com. Here on the Half Price Concessions podcast, and joining us is Mr. Donald Bradshaw out of Burlington, North Carolina. Donald, glad to finally get you on one of these, brother. I know you are a super busy man, so we really appreciate your time. Uh, before we get into anything racing related, uh, how is everything down there in Burlington for you and your family? Uh, first off, I uh, appreciate you having me on. Um, I hate it took so long with what's been going on, but the family's doing great. Uh, Gina and I have our second uh, grandbaby. Paige and um, Wes brought us uh, Walker Andrew Parsley. So he's an addition to Wyatt. And um, then my other daughter and um, son-in-law, they're doing great too. I was about to say, now you now you got two grandsons. Does that mean uh, two go-karts down the road you have to buy or are you allowed to? <laughs> Um, uh, if it's up to my daughter to be two go karts, but I told her I was going to try to find golf clubs and tennis rackets. So <laughs> that would definitely be a cheaper hobby for sure. <laughs> definitely. So. so, um, you guys, you and you and your wife kind of got into the, uh, into the team owner side of things this year. You guys are, uh, the car owners for Tim McCready and his, uh, Longhorn, uh, Longhorn chassis house car. You guys haven't gotten a race pretty much since speed weeks because everything that's gone on, but 
Um, pretty cool. You guys got to have success right out of the gate. Tell me, uh, tell me how was speed weeks for you? I know you, did you get to be down there for all of it or did you kind of have to come and go? Uh, I was down there for the first, or through Brunswick and East Bay and then over to the other uh, Florida track we went to. And then I came home when they went to Volusia, had to get some stuff, uh, get some work caught up and go on. But speed weeks for Gina and I was great. Gina didn't get to come down uh, but a couple of days due to her mama being ill. And um, she had to go back home. But it was a great speed weeks. And to come out of the box and win the first race out, it, you know, it's a dream come through true for a car owner our car owners, I should say, Gina and I. Uh, and then to go to uh, down to East Bay and being competitive and to pick up a win down there, I, I hate the way the second win kind of came. It looked like maybe Jonathan had it in the bag. I know we was close. So I hate to see him get tore up. And then to go over in Belushi and pick up a win. I don't think it could have, we could have wrote a much better story than what we had down there. I was about to say, that's a pretty uh... – quick return on investment and especially at all those races down there. I mean, the fields are it's just insane as far as talent goes and everybody's stuff is fresh. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's so cool. You guys were able to kind of get some wins early. Cause I know there's a lot of people that if you don't come out of speed weeks running good, you kind of sitting there wondering, all right, what do we need to change? But you guys don't have that problem at all. Yeah. And, and you know, and even though we ran good, um, we, uh, uh, Phil and Jeff and Kevin and Timmy put a pretty thick notebook together when we left from down there of things they would like to try. And uh, right when this virus come about, we was about to go test uh, Kevin and them guys had put some stuff together to test. But we have not quit working since we left. Uh, we're not. We didn't leave there thinking that um, that's all we needed for the season. Um, the guys have been in the shop every day. Uh, messing with the cars kevin's been putting his engineering together and you know and then the backing that we got from bill stein and fk rod ends longhorn cornet engines mega plumbing you know it's affording us to be able to go out and look for more speed and our, and our drive tim mccready man he's on top of it he is he is absolutely pumped right now absolutely uh I've been very curious about how this whole deal even came together because I've I've always known you as a racer and as a as a you know sponsor Jonathan Davenport and other guys and your billboards at racetracks and stuff. You you guys and your business have have been longtime great friends of of racing in general. But uh, how did it even all come about for you guys to step into this role kind of as car owners? Because you know. It's got y'all's business on the side of it, mega plumbing, mega electrical, but it's not Donald Bradshaw driving a car like I'm used to seeing. So how did all that kind of come about? Uh, I guess a funny answer. Gina and I must have bumped her head along the way. But no, um, I guess started getting to know Timmy a little bit um, a couple of years ago when he came to Longhorn and we've just kind of been in touch. And then him and Jonathan become good friends. And um Timmy and I thought that uh, they had a humongous budget race team, and I come to find out they didn't. So last year during the season, during the all season, Gina and I sit down and talk and approached Timmy and Justin and Terry Labonte and them up there about putting some money in the car. But then as the season went on, it's like more and more what we've seen on Timmy and the um, drive that him and Philip had is to, for the most part, them two to be out on the road and, so they had some engine troubles. So we loaned them a motor that we had, and they pretty much had success. They won a couple of races, and one on the Lucas, and I think two off the Lucas Tour, one World of All Race. So we kind of got a little bit of taste of it, and Gene and I started talking, and me and Timmy and Kevin all of us got to talking. And one thing just led to another. I can't say that we thought we was going to be in this deep, but the more Gene and I talked, we thought, as much as we love racing, let's let's give this thing a whirlwind and try it. And, you know, we'll go two, three years. If it don't work out, we can always go back away and uh, go back to doing whatever we want to do. But that, I guess that's the simple answer. It's um, just a love the, of racing and the people we're around. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely a people sport. And you're a driver. You've, you know, uh, sponsored drivers, you know, What's what's it like for you to be 
around a guy like Tim McCready. I know an incredibly talented guy could pretty much he could drive a baby carriage if it had a motor in it and the racetrack to go to. What's what's it like for you? Because you recognize talent. What's it like when you are around someone like him and just his ability and stuff? Uh, kind of just amazed. Um, you know, he can get out of the car and uh, just to go back to me a little bit. I get out in the car. It's me. Twenty minutes later, I'm thinking, "Wow, yeah, this is what I need to do." You know, Timmy can get out in the car and he'll say. Hey, we need to. I feel like we need to do this to the left rear, do this to the right front, um, maybe put a little more traction in it. And it really just amazes me for the feel that he's got in a race car. And uh, people that don't know him, you know, Timmy can be a little quiet, and he is a very humble guy and very appreciative of what he's got. So it makes it even more special to be around him. Gotcha. We got to see if we can get him to come to one of your races and give you some feedback with you're looking for some setup. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we're hoping that um, we're going to get the test together some this year. Uh, I don't know how much racing I'll do, but um, hopefully we'll have two cars there and both of us get in there and go run some. And uh, me get in his car, him get in my car, and just see what difference we feel. Yeah. Over the last couple of years, I noticed your schedule's kind of gotten smaller and smaller. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago you made a run at running the full World Outlaw schedule. That didn't fully happen, but you, you still ran quite a bit of racing. Um, has that kind of been on purpose? You slow down a little bit on your own driving? Because it doesn't sound like your your love for racing has changed any. What's, what's kind of been the change? Uh, I think age. Uh, you get to a certain point, and I, unless you're going to race 60 times a year, your ability is not going to allow you to um, compete with uh, Jonathan or Timmy or uh, Madden and Bloomer and him. And, and not that I ever had that much ability. If I had that much ability, I wouldn't be in the plumbing business. I've been in a race car all these years. But uh, the a lot with work. Um, we've been very blessed as a company and have really great employees and we have grew our plumbing company to be pretty good and we started an electrical company and we've been blessed there and we're, in eight, we're fourth or fifth year in the HVAC business so we've took on a lot more responsibility and and you come to the point to be good in a race car even if you're going to run the clash or the ultimate you need to, be able to work on that thing five nights a week and have a guy or two guys to work on it. And um, I wasn't willing to walk away from the business at five o'clock to go work on a race car. I'd rather be on an airplane or in a truck uh, going and checking jobs and stuff. So I don't know that I necessarily wanted to walk away, but the end result said I should have because I got to look at retiring one day, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of these yeah. days. <laughs> Well, uh, shoot, I'm about to say, yeah, you know, it's 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 one of those things I miss. Uh, I miss seeing your name and all the rundowns and that kind of the regional shows and stuff because when I kind of got into dirt late model racing as a fan, you were one of the first people I noticed just because you know they would always say from Burlington, North Carolina, Donald Brasher, and I was from Burlington, and it 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 seemed like you were about the only person I knew that was from our area that was doing it. It seemed like everybody else in that kind of Alamance County area was had gone over to asphalt or was drag racing. You, you seem kind of like the outlier. Uh, am I totally wrong in that? Or did you know quite a few guys around us and I just weren't aware? No, um, the crowd of dirt racing really went away in, um, in the Burlington, Alamance County area when they paved ace. Um, you know, you had Larry Isley that was out there for a while and stayed in dirt. And then, you know, he retired and passed away. And then um, you had some, some other guys in the county that run some four-cylinder cars on dirt at 311 and some other tracks. And uh, uh, I think at one time we had a guy run modified, but no, Alamance County seemed to be all asphalt. And I actually bought a, not a late mile stock, but I bought a uh, Pro Challenge car on asphalt and went and ran about four races. And I don't take this as me dock, knocking asphalt because it takes a whole lot of talent to drive a race car. But, man, it just didn't do nothing for me. Um uh, and, and I don't know why. And I had run a little bit of dirt in the 
86, 87, 88. Um, found out really quick that I was broke. I just didn't know I was broke. So we give up racing really quick because we didn't have the funds to go do it and do it right. But uh, it, it's pretty neat. You would be surprised at the people from Burlington that show up at this track at Fayetteville and 311 and some of the closer tracks. Um, that loved dirt racing and I, you know, and it kind of, I think it gave them a joy to see me. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of a people person if you had never noticed. So, <laughs> Oh yeah. You're definitely not an introvert to say the least. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes you wish you could back up and like you could have done this from 25 on, but I wouldn't change my life for nothing. So I got to start racing a little late on dirt on dirt cars or race go-karts for a long time but hey, i wouldn't change nothing i've been blessed beyond means i was gonna say i, I definitely want you to uh tell us a little bit about it. it was a story you told me about when you were running go-karts and stuff and you told me about getting to run at daytona i think in the shifter carts uh when about was that and, and tell me about what that was no it wasn't uh Shift carts. I went to Daytona and we ran flat track carts down there back in the okay. in the nineties. Uh, we used to go to the stadium. Um, I think it was called Daytona Middle Stadium. We run a quarter mile track around the football field. And back in the nineties, you would go down there at Christmas, and you, you would line up for stock medium for the people at no go kart race. And you'd have I was able to run stock medium, stock uh, heavy, and and senior stock back in them days and it would be 200 go-karts trying to make a 24 cart field. So when you left there, if you made the field, you had won. It's kind of like going to El Door. You know, you make the field, you really won the race down there. And, uh, uh, but we raced go-karts. Me and my dad got in and we raced up to about 86, kind of walked away from go-karts. Like I said, dabbled in race cars. And then in the nineties got pretty heavy in it and then was fortunate enough in 2001, won a national championship no carts, and then I won some state rate state championships too in the 2000s. So, so we had a pretty good go kart career, and, and it was kind of like World of Outlaws. What we done, we was a traveling circuit that went from Tennessee to Florida to Virginia, Alabama, Georgia. You know, it's kind of like hooking up with the Ultimates here, really, and going and running different different states. Did you get to uh, run into any guys that you'd end up racing down the road when you got in the dirt late model, or was it a pretty separate crowd? Yeah. It's some, but I really didn't race against them. Uh, Chris Madden actually runs some go karts, and there's a few others. I, I run in a guy from Wilmington that run a little race, and he raced at Fayetteville a little bit that had a race car, but not many of them. A lot of the guys that, that raced when I did that's my age or have completely walked away from go karts, or they are owners of teams that run go karts. And, you know, if you do a little research, you can run a go kart for about three or four or five thousand dollars any Saturday night, and um, basically run for the same amount of money that a local super late ball show runs for. It's yeah. kind of sad. It is. They had a fifty thousand dollar win go kart race a couple of years in a row, and uh, and it's nothing to see a ten thousand dollar win race. You probably see that made to them a year now. I'm about to say, I think they, uh, I think the king of the concrete at the Greensboro Coliseum pays three. Yeah, that is correct. Does it, does it ever make you think about tripping no. that trigger and going no. back out there? <laughs> out of all the years I ran go karts, when I walked away in 2004, I think I sat back in one one time, and I don't know what happened, but when I walked away, I'm scared to death to drive one of getting hurt in one. Um, once you get in something with a roll cage, it, it, you think a thousand times why you ever rode in something that didn't have a roll cage. You know, yeah. you, the good Lord looked after me quite a bit. Hey, well, I, I'm glad yeah. he kept you safe. Cause... <laughs> so tell me about uh, when you got in the in the dirt super for the first time. Tell me about that. Oh, man, I, I don't – I've never done drugs, so I, can't, I don't know. All I can tell you is what people tell you, but that was the most adrenaline rush I've ever felt. I guess the closest thing to it is maybe um, – I will go back. I did run a two-cycle go-kart uh, uh, part of a season for a guy I drove for somebody, and that thing was a, a beast to drive. And when I got in that super, that adrenaline rush was like being at Carowinds and jumping off the biggest hill, heading down it. But 
except it didn't quit at the bottom of the hill. It went for 20, 30 laps, whatever you raced. It just kept going. So, Gotcha. Gotcha. I've, I've heard that from a few guys where they just talk about that super just being, like you said, kind of just such an incredible rush. And it's funny because, you know, from the grandstand, it looks like you guys are maybe under control for about a split second on the straightaway, and then you're back to sliding through the corner. And, oh, by the way, you're trying to pass people. People are trying to pass you. Space gets tight really quick. You got 900 horsepower at your foot. It, it, it seems like a whole lot going on. Yeah, uh, it is a whole lot going on. Because to, to really be good at these cars, you know, you it's a whole lot of throttle control and a whole lot of on and off brake easy. But, you know, and they do look kind of controlled, and we are out of control sometimes. But with the way these cars are designed and the shock package now, um, it is unreal to side bite these cars have. You would think they didn't have no G-force because it looks like you're sliding, but you have a whole lot of G-force. And in these cars, when they're right and you turn them, when you turn your wheels left and right, getting in the corner, these cars will point and go where you want them to go. Um, I know it don't look like that, but 90% of the time they are. And, you know, and, and when it really shows up is when you watch McCready and Jonathan and uh, some of these other guys that do it for a living, man, they could, uh, you could lay a dime in the racetrack and they could drive over it every time and, and not have to have somebody point it out on making them cars are that much under control. Well, with all the dirt racing you have gotten to do, I mean, you, you've gotten to go to some pretty cool places as a driver and as a sponsor and whatnot. What's, has there been any track in particular you've gone to and it's kind of just like kind of sat you back a little bit or – you kind of like gazed around and was like, oh, man, I can't believe I'm actually here and getting the race or just getting have to be, here. Have to be Eldor. Um, I went there when I first got into racing about 08 in a crate car, and we went up there and ran pretty good. And then uh, two or three years ago, maybe four years ago, we went up there in a supercar. And, and when you pull out on that racetrack on Saturday night, and we didn't make the feature, but we still got to run some on Saturday night. And every seat in the stands are packed. The infield's packed. The grass is packed. You're going, wow. I, and and to me, I guess it's kind of what a guy does when he gets to Winston Cup for the first time and sees all the people there. And then one of my favorite tracks for a long time to go to was East Alabama. Uh, they had a three shows in a year that was pretty good paying money shows. And uh, that was just a fun, fun racetrack to uh, race home. I about to say every every time I've ever watched East East Alabama on pay per view, I've never been there in person, but it just seems insane. Man, it seems like they have like eighteen <laughs> classes of late models. It seems like, but they're all full fields. Like the participation is just crazy down there, and the fans as well. That place just seems like it's like uh like it's just special carved out of heaven or something like that. Is that the farthest you've ever? No, I've been race? all the way down into Texas. I've been over to Illinois and raced. Um, of course, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and I've raced at Volusia a couple of times. So, but other than that, that's, you know, Maryland. So, but I guess the father's drive was at Illinois and Texas. So, yeah. Oh, okay. What's the, what's the fastest one you've been on? Have you, have you been on any um, track that scared you? West Virginia Motor Speedway. I've heard that from a lot of people. I never uh, seen it. It was me about built. That. And I don't know the year, but it was built as a five-eighths mile wide racetrack. In the history that I got, I wasn't racing dirt cars when it started, but the history I got, that thing was built. And they may have run Arca there, and the guy that built it had all plans of asphalt in that thing and hoping to get book, you know, uh, Affinity cars or Western Cup cars back in the time. And it had really nice stands, nice pit areas. But that was the only track I've been in a dirt late model. And I probably had, that was probably 2009. Um, I was going down the back straightaway, and the guy moved in front of me. And when he moved, my car changed lanes, and I never turned the steering wheel. You were, you was moving oh, geez. up there. And um, we had fun. We raced. We made the feature. And then I went back. They shortened the track. Some new owners bought it, and they shortened the track for four or five years later and i went back there and led every lap of a crate race but the last lap 
and let a guy get by me on the last lap up there. That, uh, that was a heck of a racetrack. So that thing just seems like a monster, man. Like you said, with the you said a guy in front of you moves and it moves your car. That is. Yeah, that's I a little guess, scary. You know, that's what the Winston Cup guys feel. I've never drove a Winston Cup car, but you know they talk about it. But um, I'll tell you another fast race track, uh, and it's probably one of the best surfaces you will race on, and that is Whitfield, Virginia. Fred Brown owns it. Um, that is an awesome race track. And I know you've, you've been up there and announced, and I think you've seen me race up there quite a few times. So. Yep. Uh, it's probably my favorite track to go to because you can sit on the hill. There's clean restrooms if you bring a lady. And you're going to get a gorgeous sunset. It don't matter when you go. You're going to get cold at night. But the track, i never seen a better prepared track in my life. And I'm just up there in the stands. you you the one down there on the track. Is yes, it as sir. smooth as it, it looks? It is as smooth as it looks. And when that man, that's one of the few tracks that you roll in in the country. And he tells you, unless he's had a rainstorm. When he tells you to roll out for hot laps, you just pull out on the track and hold it wide open. Because it's, when he tells you, tells you it's ready, it's ready. So, Gotcha. I always wanted to ask you this, Donald. And I, and I don't know if maybe it was it was after your time or you you're, you might have been a little bit late on it. Did you ever get to run at a log cabin? No, I didn't, but I've seen one race up there. And um and me and my, it wasn't my father-in-law then, but it was me and my father-in-law, and I can't remember who went, who else went with us. But we went up there, and they had, I can't remember if it was running at Martinsville or what, but uh, Tim Richmond was there, David Allison was there, um, David Pearson was there, Bobby Allison was there, and Kyle Petty, and probably a couple more. And they had that, they had a regular late mall race, and then them guys ran. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, David Pearson had it won and blew up, and Bobby Allison won it. That was about 80, maybe 86, 87, somewhere in there. Yeah. So, wow. But that track was ahead of its time. It had a tunnel going into it, which our rigs today wouldn't go through that tunnel, but it, it definitely it had a tunnel going under the racetrack, going to the pit area. What's the smallest one you've been on? Hmm. In the Carolinas, I would say it would be uh, County Line, and then I'm, I think, I can't remember the track I ran at in Illinois, but it was a quarter-mile track at a fairground, and it was small. Um, it might have been on just a little bit more than a fifth of a mile, but it was probably 80 feet wide all the way around it. What was, uh, did you have kind of a certain kind of track that you liked? Like, did you kind of like those big hammer down half miles or did you kind of prefer the small ones what, what was kind of your preference when i just first from the started the bigger the track the better i liked it uh i guess just by not not getting to get in a race car until i was in my 30s you know a super competitive car to my late 30s i've never liked to run up against the wall but if a race track a big race track was from bottom to three quarters up the track the more i loved it but the older i've got i like not because of the speed, I still like to go fast, but I like the smaller ones because I actually think they produce better side by side racing for the fans than the wide open racetracks do. Gotcha. Gotcha. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of torn on it. I, I feel like there's some big tracks you can see a good race at, but it seems like, like you said, sometimes the smaller ones produce a little better racing, which is why I'm really excited to see. Uh, what'll come of Fayetteville whenever they finally get to run on it. Now that they've kind of reconfigured it a little bit to be a little bit smaller. Now it would, it would be nice to go back that and, uh, win, to win a race. Cause I won on it when it was big and it'd be nice to be able to go back and see if you couldn't do it once they, uh, since they've made it smaller. So. Yeah. Now you've, one of the things about you, I find pretty interesting. You've ran the super, You've ran the crate late model, and uh, you run the limited with the 525. What was kind of the reason behind jumping between those classes of cars and stuff? Or or was it really in a round? Maybe we just trying, trying new things? things. When I got in, in 2006, I bought a car. And really, the crate had just took off, but we bought a limited motor from Clements, and we ran, ran about six or seven races 
eight races, and all of a sudden, the Nemity just started drying up. They were none. Each track was having eight cars, and it was just kind of miserable, so we bought a crate. So really, 2000, from three quarters of 2000, that last quarter of 2006, 2007, 2008, I just about run, I ran nothing but crate. And at the end of 2008, I bought a supermotor off the fella and went and ran it. And then we had a, because it paid so good in crate, we had a supermotor and a crate car, and we would run both. Um, and now I'm showing my age. I can't remember what year we started the 525 series. Was that 13? 14? 2014, me and Jim Bagley had sat down and kind of started kicking around something to try to make a competitive limited, limited class. It didn't cost $25,000, but a limited motor and all. So that's how in 14, I started running limited again, which was with 525 was because Jim and I started a class and we brought uh, Jason Atkins on to um, help help us get started. And, you know, and you come on as an announcer and a lot of good people. And uh, Jason went out and helped us hunt up tracks and stuff. And so that's how I got back into limited there. But the, I've run the most races in Creighton and Super and then um, – we all know the recession that we went through in nine and 10. So I'd sold all my super stuff then in this run crate because it was more economical. Well, you know, I know you've been in victory lane several different ways as a driver, as a sponsor, and now you've been there as an owner. Which, which one, which one is the most fun? Oh, which, which one is the best? Feeling? No, no, hands down the driver. Um, it's just, yeah, that is, um, and I've had people tell me I never get really excited in Victory Lane, but um, that is something you work at. It's so hard to get there. It's this uh, unreal feeling, and and not saying it don't take a lot of work to get there as a car owner too, because you got to have the right people with, in the right place at the right time. But uh, you know, so many good cars out here today. Uh, any Saturday night, I don't care where you go. Most time, the top ten cars are. Are competitive cars, and then the next five are are pretty damn competitive. So anytime you win, it, it's just an unreal feeling, and that goes all the way back to go karts. You know, it, it takes a lot of preparation to win. Um, it takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Is there anywhere still on the bucket list you'd like to cross off before you put the steering wheel away for? Good? I would like to win another super race. So. Uh, don't okay. matter where it's at. Doesn't I, matter I'd where like it is. Win another super race, and 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 it's two. Which I'd like to win any race, really. But it's a whole lot of motivation behind that. Um, a lot of people that know anything about me know. Uh, most people called him Spanky, but uh, Brian Keith Parrish passed away the uh, the Friday after Christmas, which was a big loss to Gene and I. He'd been with us since two thousand seven as a full time employee. Worked on race cars and and um, he had had some trouble, had kidney cancer, got over it, and he had lung cancer. And, and you asked me about slowing down. That that had a lot to do with it too, because Keith wasn't able to go, and um, we tried not to push him. And you know we have Al that's helped us on race car forever, but I would really like to put one in Victory Lane, just to thank Keith for all he's done, and and Al too. You know Al's but but Al's still with us. But it, that even made winning at um, Brunswick that much more special. Um, to know that Keith had helped us assemble, start assembling them cars before he passed away. So that that meant a lot. I'm about to say one one thing I always remember about Spank. You never you never had to wonder what was on his mind. I remember one time I came pulling up to your shop in my F-150. And first thing Spank said to me when he saw me was, "Don't roll them windows down too much. You know that uh, there's something in that uh, window <laughs> mechanism that'll break on a Ford." And I was like, "Well, nice to see you too, Spank. That, How that you doing? How's your day?" <laughs> and, uh, man, he was uh, he was one of these guys that you know he worked for Mega Plumbing, but his main deal was to keep our um, our equipment out on the job sites going, and then he he maintained the race car, but. You never had to wonder if he was working or not. He, he was all in, 100% all in of whatever he done. I know, I don't remember how many years ago it was when 
Tony Stewart was doing the uh, the prelude to the dream deal up at Eldora. And I remember you guys going up there and I think you were I forget who it was you were supplying a car for, but tell me tell me about what that experience was like with those NASCAR guys trying to hop in there and see what they could do in, in that twenty three hundred pound rocket really ship. We, uh, we actually had Brian Vickers as our driver and uh that come together uh, because of Kevin Rumbly working at a uh, C V products in um the uh the deal they had going, they they was really wanting to go in Eldor with Jonathan driving the car, and they didn't want to uh, take a chance tearing that car up. So they come to me and ask, would I do it? And I, and I think I'm right. It's been so long ago. And it might have been Jonathan was driving for Barry. But anyway, Vickers ended up in it. But it was a good deal. We went and tested a couple of times. And, man, he was a great guy. Um, and we still all stayed in touch for a while till he got out of NASCAR. And then we was going to actually do it a second time. And um, – Brian had his uh, problem with his blood, whatever was wrong with him. And if you'll remember announcing the Ace, him and his car actually come, we brought the race car to Ace and left a wrap on it. And he come and signed autographs yeah. and stuff over there uh, to raise money for that. Um, but it was pretty cool. We ended up parking beside Clint Boyer's team. And Jimmy Johnson was driving one car and Clint was driving the other one. And then, um, Ken Schrader was on the other side of us, so it it was pretty interesting. Um, them guys are fun to be around. They just want to be treated like regular people. They don't want to be hounded. Uh, Tony come over and hung out in the pits a little bit, but that was a neat deal, and it was it was neat to be involved in something that was giving back to the to the communities and to charities and stuff. I would bring. I wish I'd bring it back. The fact that I wish they would too. It was. It was just so cool because you would see, like, the NASCAR guys, but then, like, Cruz Pedregon would come over from drag racing, and I think Ricky Carmichael tried to run it one year. like, And then I think it was that one year they, they put Daryl Waltrip in the two-seater, and he yep, got scared to yep, death by it. Tony Stewart. It was, just, it was just something interesting. The fact that you were that close to Schrader and Boyer – Makes me wonder how uh, uh, you made it, it out good. You know, with uh, those two. Boyer knows in – which kind of come through Jonathan Boyer built a race shop and we went up there and done some plumbing and stuff on it for him. But we still, I still talk to Casey, his brother, um, every so often I'll call him or he'll call me, but, uh, it was a pretty good deal. We ended up being friends with Boyer and him after that. And we'd go hang out at the shop and me and Gina'd ride up there and see him. But then, like I said, them guys, for the most part, I can't say every one of them, but most of them just want to be treated they don't always want to talk about NASCAR. They want to talk about something else. Something you definitely wouldn't know. You guys have been uh, with Jonathan Davenport in one capacity or another for quite some time, and now he's – I think he's on his third national championship driving the 49. Tell me about uh, tell me about what that ride's been like with him because you, you guys yeah, have been with him for, for uh, quite a while, since haven't you? 2008, I believe. Uh, me and Jonathan kind of met. He was actually working at Barry's part time, and uh, I had Barry Wright cars, and we met and we spoke a little bit. We was racing one night, and Jonathan just so happened to park beside us, and uh, we was at Mondale Speedway, and I'd bought a brand new Barry Wright car, and I went out, and um, I can't remember if I won my heat race or qualified on the pole, but we started up front, and Jonathan started outside of me, and uh, in. We kind of didn't know what to do to the car, and Jonathan come over and says, well, I think you ought to do this and that. And the guy he was driving for, which is his father-in-law now, they had a Rayburn car. And, you know, proud story. We ended up out running Jonathan, and I know Jonathan went a three-time Lucas Oil champion, but, you know, everybody knows his abilities always been there. And we ended up winning that thing, and me and him become friends, and it's just kind of stuck in there. It's, um, it's, you know, 16, 18 years difference in our age, but uh, we don't talk every day, um, but sometimes we may talk four times a week. Sometimes we may go a month and not speak, but it's just a, a friendship. Uh, his son was in um, Paige's wedding when she got married, and uh, we hang out as much as we can. But uh, as long as he drives for somebody that don't stop Gene and I from sponsoring him, as long as we got the money, we'll probably always be on whatever he drives. It's just one of them. Um, he's more family than it is a friend. What's it been like for you to see kind of how he's grown? Because just in that period of time, 
he's gone from, like you said, kind of a younger guy cutting his teeth. I've heard stories about him trying to knock walls down in Tacoa and other places to now where he's, you know, he's he's got a he's got a pretty good following going. What's what's it been like for you to just see him kind of grow and mature uh, it, like it, he it has in this deal. little I mean, bit of time? He, you know, when I first met him, he was just as talented as he he is now. But it was either kind of win or or wreck him. And then he kind of went through the stage. He backed down a little bit, and then you know he went to Warriors and had a decent run over there. Um, and it didn't it, it didn't work out like you thought. And then it was like when he left there and, and that didn't work out, I don't know what happened there, but when he left that ride, he become a whole different driver and more of a thinking driver. It is awesome to just see him um, dissect a race. Uh, he he does some things, and I'm not going to talk about what he does, but he does some things in the car, in his mind and stuff he's told me. All I can think about is driving, and he is um, – he, he thinks of the racetrack in different parts while he's driving, which I guess that's the reason he's a professional and I'm a plumber. Um, professional race car driver and I'm a plumber. But it, it's been a great journey. And, you know, and he's really matured. Um, he's very smart with his money, uh, very, very loyal to his family. So he's not a better person I think anybody can be connected with. And and, and that being said, I'm not putting McCready down. It, and McCready's that same guy. You know what I'm saying? Which I didn't know McCready when he was younger, but he is a very loyal family guy too. And um and and is very dedicated to his fans. Well, I'll get you out of here on this one. When all this corona stuff clears and we finally get the go aheads and we can finally start going back to racetracks. Uh is there any plans for you to, to be in the seat anymore here in twenty twenty or is it kind of uh, it is how it all plans. shakes out? We don't know if it'd be crater super, but um uh, First off, we're going to get our, you know, get the Polar, Polar Motorsports, uh, Bill Stein Shock team back going and um, get them back up and running and, and make sure they got everything they need. And then me and Wesley Page will uh, venture out and do some local racing. I'm, I think we got plans to try to do Super Race at Lakeview and Fayetteville. And if they happen to have one at 3 11, we'll probably try to go there. But uh, I'm looking forward to going and spectating some too. Gina and I was hoping to uh, be able to go to maybe 10 or 15 races while McCready and him's out on the road some this year. Awesome. Well, brother, I appreciate the time as always. Wish you guys the absolute best. And uh, as soon as this stuff clears and we go see some racing, I'll be glad to either see your race car running and doing well or you running and doing well. But uh, I really appreciate the time, brother, and thank you for everything you did for me and um, well, I like it's said, good to hear uh, from again, you, man. It's good to hear you, boys. Uh, you taking the time to uh, give me an opportunity to tell a little bit about uh, Gene and I's life and the story of racing. But uh, the most part, uh, I want everybody to stay safe out there. Um, keep the eye on the big picture. You know, God controls all. And um, hopefully, this ain't clear on out of here and we'll get back on the racetrack. But, you know, first off, we got to make sure our, our citizens are safe. Thank you for listening to yet another edition of the Half Price Concessions Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, Himalaya, Castro, whatever podcast app you're using. Please hit the subscribe button. If there's a section to leave us a rating and review, please leave us a good one. It would really help us out a ton. Also, if you're listening on our YouTube page, hit the subscribe button there. That way, you'll get notified every time we put out new episodes. Also, you can email the show. The email address is halfpricedconcessionspodcast at gmail.com. You can email us questions, concerns, ideas for future episodes, anything and everything. We'll definitely respond to it, and we just appreciate you listening. Also, if you have friends or family who want to listen but don't want to go to YouTube and don't have a podcast app, you can listen to every episode on our website. That's www.anchor.fm slash HPC podcast. Thank you for listening. My name is Tyler Williams, and I hope that you have a great day.